Eaton, thanks. How are you? Not too bad. Excellent. So, the market's shifting, and I wanted to tap into your expertise and talk about the uh, Burr strategy, or buy, renovate, rent, and refinance. So, yes. are you fond of it? Do you like it? Do you hate it? You know, it's an interesting strategy, and just to clarify too, it says that we're talking about other stuff in the title, so I didn't know. If no, no worries, it, because you didn't refresh your page, it's not updated, but we are good to go. Okay, good, good. I don't want to confuse people. <laughs> so yes, talking about burrs, you know, I really like them if you're um, a couple of different scenarios where you're an investor that you want to buy something that you're improving the investment because right off the hop, you've made some money on the property before you've even done anything to it. You bought it for a good deal. So then that way you're protecting your investment because you've actually increased the value instantly, just a little bit. So then moving forward, that's, you know, rule 101, buying an investment, making it worth money. You can't control market, but you can control the, the purchase price. So I like them because usually when you're working on a burr, Keaton, I find that strategically it's because you're finding properties that people just don't want to rehab themselves. So it's in a strategy, strategy all itself to just say, oh, I just want to find properties that are tired and need work. Yeah. No, for sure. It's uh I definitely like it because it's one of the more flexible strategies. You know, it's a, it's putting some lipstick on a buy and hold ultimately, but you get the benefits of the, I would say the lower risk profile long-term of the buy and hold, but you also get some of the value add benefits of flipping strategies. And um, there's actually ways you can alter the approach or the timelines to, to create a, a safer investment. And one of my favorite examples is, you find that property that's you know 15 years old needs some love but it's still respectable you'd still let your parents stay there for a month you know it's yeah. not sexy but it's not terrible and it's safe you buy it you let your tenants live in it you've obviously part of your buying process and maybe we'll dig into that is planning the renovations you're going to do the value add what changes you can make but at the end of the day if you can get good tenants and demand a fair rent because it's you know it's on that edge um, you have the benefit of eventually when they leave, if they damage anything, paint on the walls, you get a bad tenant. It's almost a risk management because what do you care if they damage the flooring and they ripped up the carpet and they broke a toilet? You mitig mitigate one of your worst case scenarios, which is tenant damage, at least as long as it's not an extreme, because you bought the property right at the edge where it needs the work, but you could still get good tenants and good rent. If you do have any issues, then, hey, you're going to go burr it. So who cares? The yeah. flip side is if you win the lottery, you get that dream tenant. They stay for 15 years. Mm -hmm. It's a low cost property, low maintenance, low issues. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I, I really enjoy how flexible the strategy is, but I wanted your perspective on this. When you're, when you have an investor who's looking to do a burr, what do you do to look for candidates for it? How do you find those deals? Yeah. What, what's, what's the approach for a realtor who understands this stuff? That's a very good question. You know, a lot of people say, you know, that just network, make lots of calls, knock on doors. But that really is not a strategic method that I use because it's too chaotic. It's actually not focused enough. So the strategies that I really enjoy using, and I think a lot of investors that have done this a few times understand it better, is finding people, not properties, people that you hear are in need of this as a solution. For example, how many times have we talked to people, you know what, grandma and grandpa just passed away. They're dreading, you know, dealing with the house, you know, probate happened already. It was six months ago to a year ago. They've got this house that's, you know, 30, 40 years uh, since any renovations have been done and it's all been paid for. And they just don't want the hassle of saying the realtor's going to tell them to paint it and, and dress it up and stage it and make it look nice because they're like, we've never even lived in this house. What if we find problems? Like, we have no idea if we make it look good. Ignorance yeah so in this situation i actually put advertisements out for people who are trying to get a cash offer on a property and it's okay and or desired if the property needs work please contact us we'd love to help you that's one simple strategy but it's very effective yeah no that makes sense yeah, on the flip side, believe it or not, foreclosures are not usually a good deal. But it's funny how a lot of people want to know, well, what if I just buy a bunch of foreclosures and I'm going to get a deal? Well, no, usually in Canadian banks, and Keaton, I'd love your input on this. In Canada, our banks seem to think that, yeah, it's tired, needs a lot of work, but the, the house next door sold for 400000 So even though there's no warranties, 
loads of risk, as is, where is, whatever condition it's in on possession day, not the day that you looked at it, is how you take it over. But we still want the same as what the neighbor got when really it should be 30, 40, 50 grand cheaper. Okay. So that's when I start going, okay, everybody wants a foreclosure. Not too many people realize that's actually what they're getting into when they're looking at a foreclosure. They're not often very good deals. However, I can tell you one story where a client of mine actually got a great deal on a foreclosure just because it was a little tweak in the market, you know, following those market trends up and down. And it was simply this. It was a two-story home that it was in a complex. All the neighbors were selling in this, you know, 325 to 300 range because the market was depressed. This is a couple years ago. And it was just, it was hard to sell in that community. Well, here's the funny thing. There was a foreclosure that was listed at 275. No one wanted it. 250, no one wanted it. So it's not often you see a bank that actually reduces the price on foreclosures that dramatically and or that swiftly. And we just happened to be watching it for a couple of weeks. This property was reduced down to like 240. Mm -hmm. And I said to my client, look, here's the deal. Do you have cash? Let's throw a cash off for no conditions for 220 just to see what they say. And she got the property. So for 220, she picked up this thing. And the funny thing is we went inside the property and it was vacant already. That was a key thing. When you're doing a fix and flip or a burr, I always love to look for vacant properties because at least the condition will likely stay the same. Okay. And she goes ahead and we look at this property. It literally needed a coat of paint, Keaton. And right down, uh, as soon as she closed on it, right down the block, the same one was up and it was listed even at 375 and she, or 275. And, and so they were listed at a good deal. And she just picked this thing up for 220. So, you know, it's vacant properties, tired properties, things that are something you can see what you're buying, but not something that you're, you got somebody trying to get full market value. Like they've staged it, painted it, and they're trying to just make a few bucks on the thousand dollars they spent. <laughs> right. Now you, you want to, you want to burn that sad property, not the one that looks happy and healthy. But um, I, I definitely think that there's two different approaches that people have to be aware of. One is that there's, there's kind of the lipstick burr. You're going to go in, you do flooring, mm -hmm. painting, you yep. do the exterior, but you're, you're doing cosmetic work. And I find that those burrs can be really, they can be nice for taking that stigmatized property and just scrubbing the stigma off it. Yeah. The flip side is the bigger projects, the going in, adding a suite, doing full renovations. Yes. And typically these are going to require permits. And I think the best thing you can do as an investor, the one takeaway you should get from this is you need a realtor who's willing to fight for you if you need permits to wrap it into your purchase side of things where you can Absolutely. waive your conditions. Part of your subject removal is buyer or seller will sign ABC and maybe we'll dig into that with you, Chris, but it gives you permission to begin your permitting process two months before you close while you're still on the seller's dime for carrying costs. Yeah. So oh, how do you approach that, Chris? Like, how do you, how does that conversation go with the seller? Yeah. Do you do it when the offer is written at condition removal? Like, how do you approach it? It's a good question. And I think, you know, like anything, when you're buying a property, you want to go with the least amount of conditions when you're buying the property. And then you want to make sure that you secured the correct conditions before signing off. So at the end of the day, the more information like that could sound really scary. Oh, yeah, we're, we got our financing. We've got everything lined up, but we want access for the property for the next two weeks indefinitely to make sure that we can get our trades in there. And blah, blah, blah. they're going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, do you guys really have your stuff figured out or do you need to do homework before you write this offer? <laughs> so there's the tip there is even if you are very well planned out, it could be perceived that you're not if you approach the offer with that term. But in the event that you're in a situation, especially if the property is vacant, but even if someone's living in there, when you're in, at the stage where you're like, okay, we're ready to sign off. We just want to clarify a few details. And I've even done this with infill developers too, where we have, you know, probably could be 60 days before we can get the permits on this stuff. And we have a 45 day possession. Then now we're, you know, 45 plus 60. Now we're at 75 days out before we can start any work. So we write a clause in the contract. I'm not going to give specific wording to everybody, you know, beware, use the right legal terminology. But essentially what the wording says is this, the buyer and the seller agree that they're going to grant access and give written permission to the buyer to achieve and acquire all any permits necessary. So basically they can go to the city and say, look, I don't own this property yet, but here's the letter from the seller that authorizes me to go and get whatever permits I want and choose. 
They've given me written authority. That's all you need, but make sure the wording is correct. That's the default there. Um, so full disclosure, getting that in before you sign off on conditions, but don't muddy up the offer prior to having a signed agreement that, yep, we got an offer. And yes, we want to accept your price because the more conditions like that you can put on, the harder it is to get a good deal. No, for sure. I definitely think it's important to know that your point of highest leverage with a seller is when you're waiving conditions. Hey, Chris, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, we're going to make this binding. You're going to get a check in five weeks, no matter what. But just need to ask one more thing before you know this is a done deal. You're in a much better position than, hey, Chris, you know, we want to offer you this. It's not for sure for two weeks. We, you know, we want to inspect the home, go through permits, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. It the seller is not at the point where if they say yes, it's done. It's at the point where if they say yes, they get to wait two weeks and maybe it's done. So I find it's far more effective to make these asks, these last little things, the icing on the cake for you as an investor at the yeah. point of your condition removal. And the nice thing is this can be the difference of you can have a 17% a, a ROI deal versus a 25% ROI deal. Because mm -hmm. sometimes you've got to close in private, you've got more expensive financing. Um, yeah. And what you can do is if you can cut two months off your financing, let's say, where you're vacant, yeah. you're losing the income of the property, you're in these higher carrying costs, often your insurance costs are higher while your property's vacant because they often consider it a commercial uh, yeah. process or a commercial application. Mm -hmm. You can start to creep that return on your investment up while lowering the risk on your deal. And what yeah. I really, really love, the cherry on top, what we like to do with our more complex clients is we'll actually get a private, we can get a, uh, what's the right way to put it? A private commitment from a lender so that you can write a cash offer conditional mm -hmm. on one thing. We know, yeah. hey, Chris, 99% we're going to get you approved to the bank. We'll have no issues. Yeah. 1% we have financing issues. Here's your worst case scenario that's prepared before you write your offer. Yeah. Um, and it, it can be super effective. And it's just the way you can keep creeping that needle up. So all yeah. of a sudden, your, your average deal for an average investor becomes a great deal for a great investor. Yeah. Because you just sharpen the knife a little bit. Totally. And in conjunction with that, so you're talking about timing, you're talking about making the best offer. And I'll be honest with you, Keaton, too. One of the things that I find has been most successful for clients getting Burr properties is buying properties that are not listed. You know, at the end of the day, you have more time on your hands. The seller has no, and you know, hey, we got a deadline here to meet because I got somebody else waiting. Finding a property that there's less demand on because it's not listed is often really, really fruitful with the grace of so the timelines just being so much more relaxed. But here's the situation too. It's easy to get a seller to understand, look, we don't want you to paint. We don't want you to go clean the bathtubs. We don't want you to clean the sinks. We don't need you to go and fix the staircase. It's okay because at this price, we're gonna be able to just say, we understand we're getting a bit of a better deal. We're not trying to snow you but you understand you're giving up a little bit because you're putting nothing into this. You don't have to go and try to figure out how to get another dollar. Build the convenience into the offer. Yeah, for the convenience, absolutely. And so, you know, just a reminder for people, buy, renovate, refinance, and rent. And then a lot of the terms that we get on the other end is ARV. What is ARV? Well, we have to evaluate the property. Be smart before you buy a property in a burr and say, what is this going to be worth after renovations are valued? Okay, so ARV. When I see people that are flipping for the first couple of times and or they're trying to, I often feel that that's where they miss the boat. They go, this house sold for 500. This is only 350. I've got tons of money to be able to put into this and make some money. But what they don't realize is they're not considering changing the floor plan. They didn't want to take out a wall. They didn't want to move a window or move a door. And sometimes, as, especially as a realtor, I see the biggest potential is not. I think we lost you, Chris. But um, while and I wait for Chris to get back. Oh. And there, you're back now? There you yeah. go. Um, so that whole concept of like pulling a wall back, and that might cost you a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks to do that. Now you've enhanced the property in the function of it not the look of it and that is what i find a lot of people miss when they're evaluating homes is they look too much at courts and stainless appliances and hardwood floors they don't pay attention to floor plans and floor plans are where you can actually make a ton of money 
if you can alter a floor plan easily. Not a lot of work. Mm -hmm. The last thing I really wanted to touch on is the we know that the market's heating up. We know that it's getting more and more active. Listings are getting snatched up and buyers are starting to compete. Um, one of the reasons that I like the burst strategy in these types of markets is that you can actually position yourself that if you do get lucky and never count on appreciation, but if you do get it, you can actually use the refinance aspect of the burr to pull some of that appreciation out. Yep. You can't traditionally do that if there's no renovation aspect. If you go back That's to a right. lender and say, hey, I bought this place four months ago, it went up in value, I want my money. They'll usually say, wait a year, wait two years. But yeah. if we approach the right lenders and we have the renovation aspect, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, it tends to work. So if you're in a yeah. position where you're trying to be really efficient as an investor and cycle your money forward, um, the burst strategy can be really good in these types of markets where we're buying in the early spring and we're selling in the late spring, early summer, or I should say appraising. Too much talk about flips these days. But the last <laughs> thing I wanted to touch on real quick is one of the biggest risks of the birth that a lot of people don't think about. How are you going to pay for your renovations? And we'll often see this used through unsecured credit. And there's something called utilization that makes up 25% of your credit score. If you're revolving pieces of credit, so lines of credit, home equity lines of credit, or credit cards go above 50% of their limit when they report, they will drag your score down substantially. And it's important right. if you're planning on that refinance, you're managing your situation in a way that you're going to qualify for the refinance. Because if your right. credit plummets, you can get stuck. That's a really good point because refinancing means requalifying. <laughs> and so yeah, I love your attention to that detail, Keaton, because a lot of people go, oh, it's no problem. We're just going to renovate and our plan B is to refinance. <laughs> but if that's where the conversation stops, ooh, now I can see you might find yourself in trouble on the other end. Well, it's, it's, yeah. it's a trap, right? Oh, well, we just qualified. We won't have issues again. Um, mm -hmm. But the other thing, too, is how you structure your financing. There's ways that you can do a burr that triggers new legal fees, new appraisal costs, and you pay a penalty on your existing mortgage, or you pay higher interest to avoid that penalty. But there's actually another way you can structure it using a collateral charge mortgage where you can avoid the legal fee costs and you can avoid the penalties on your mortgage which that alone could save you seven, eight, nine thousand dollars And, you know, if you're doing a $300,000 project, it's substantial. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a good point. You know, we're not lawyers. We need to make sure what lawyers are actually going to need to do if you go down that path. So again, making out the plan and you can do all this during your condition time period, right? Like, okay, well, let's, let's play with the what ifs. We've tied up the property now for 10 days. Let's see what possibly could happen. And, you know, after we close on this thing, what might we want to do? So even if your financing is approved, and I really like that you just mentioned that Keaton, it doesn't mean your strategy is set in stone. Your financing might be approved. You're ready to buy cash, so to speak, write an offer, get that thing done and into the bank. But during that time of saying, okay, what's the best approach for that ARV when we're ready to refinance and the values there, is that something that we actually need to bring someone else on now because we've messed up our credit or did we do it right the first time? Now, I have one last question for you, Chris, because we know that the appraisal is a big deal. What are your thoughts as a realtor if a client said, hey, Chris, you know, I bought that, you know, one, two, three, four Glenwood and uh, finished my renovations. We're going to have the, uh, the appraiser by next week. Uh, do you mind pulling some comps for me? And obviously you'd be privy if this is your client to what's been done. Do you mind just giving me those comps so that when I let the appraiser in, I can show them, hey, you know, this is what we based our expectations on. We expect X. Is that a, is that a normal ask for you? Is that something you get upset about? No, actually, it's quite a common ask because realistically, that's what appraisers do even in a traditional offer. They'll say, you know, oh, we're sending out an appraiser and we know the bank is supposed to do a third party appraiser, which they all do. But if the appraiser knows the, the, the chosen or accepted purchase price, they are basing their foundation. Can I make this price work? Not very often do you get an appraisal back higher than the offer price. As you're the lender, I'm sure you've seen that. And it does happen, but it's not as it's usually like 500 bucks or something laughing. <laughs> yeah. And so that's kind of funny because I've told people in, in this situation, this is really interesting. In this situation, I've had a client of mine say, Chris, you told us we got a smoking deal on this. The appraisal came back at the purchase price. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, you know, we could probably find out what their rationale was. But that's because they just wanted to make sure it was valued at what you're paying it or more. They don't want it to be less. Like if you're paying 300 for a house and it comes up to 250, you're in trouble. 
Appraisers so, have liability, right? So they want to they want to minimize that as much as possible. But it, it's funny the games that happen on the appraisal side. And, yeah, maybe you could touch on that. Like, is there a is there a benefit to someone who's going to burn if they get a good deal and the appraisal comes out at the purchase price? Is that is there a benefit to that? Uh, I wouldn't say that there's a benefit, but there's never a concern. I find a, appraisal value, whether high or low, is usually an appraisal is not what is your home worth today or what could it sell for, but rather if a bank was in a foreclosure situation or they had to find a buyer tomorrow, what is a reasonable estimate of what it would come in at? And I've probably worded it poorly. There's some appraisers I'm friends with on Facebook. They'll, their skin will crawl at that explanation, but that's the gist of it. And they're going to use comparable sales to make an estimate of what your home could sell for. But yeah. it's it's a conservative approach. It's not designed for if you get Chris Miller to sell your home and you know he does everything he can to push it, what's the best value you can get? No. It's essentially what's the lazy value you'll get is kind of how I view it. If it got thrown on the market, you know, purple brick, no work done, no listing, no staging, you know, no marketing, what would you reasonably get? And it's a lot of people get hung up on the appraisal, but they, they come in high, they come in low, low a lot more often than they come in high because it's it's yeah. in the appraiser's best interest to come in as a close to the purchase price as possible. They certainly don't want to come in over. And you actually bring up a good point, Keaton, if I can mention that. A lot of people base their burr pricing, so they don't actually involve a professional, and they just look at something they've seen online or something in an ad where it says, you know, the tax assessment is 250 and you're getting it for 175 You know, in most cases, that is probably a good you know kind of estimate as to whether or not this makes sense but you have to be weary about that because sometimes you go into neighborhoods and all the houses in the neighborhood are selling well below the assessed value because the assessed value for that neighborhood is significantly higher just based on a guesstimate the city thinks of the neighborhood being prestigious and vice versa I've seen some situations where you go into a neighborhood and everybody's evaluation is 700,000 and you see houses selling for 900 and a million the assessed value is significantly lower than the actual market value. I'm going to guess so, that's the neighborhood where the assessor lives. Yeah, that could be. <laughs> but, but just uh, maybe a food, a food for thought, interesting perspective. When you're looking at doing a burr, it's important to involve a realtor, even for information purposes, because tax assessments are not really market value. It's just how the city knows how much they can charge you for taxes. It, coming from the BC market, assessed value meant absolutely nothing to us. We just didn't care. It was irrelevant. It was years old. Um, but uh, yeah. I think the other mistake people make too, and then we'll wrap this up, is they will base their burr expectations on listings, listed comparables rather than sold comparables. Rather than sold. Yeah. What someone wants to sell for is very, very different from what they can mm -hmm. sell for. Particularly in condos and townhouses, we see sometimes whole stratas that are just grossly overpriced. One neighbor lists high, two other neighbors jump on the bandwagon, nobody sells. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, on that note as well, like when you're working with someone like myself and you're trying to find a burr, you also have to know like, what is the quality of the renovator? So this is some of the issues that I've seen come up in the past. Someone says, oh yeah, I can make this house look like that house but I don't maybe have a personal relationship with this investor that I've just met for the first time. I don't know what they're capable and or their renovation trades guys they use. So if I'm giving information based on that house, not based on this particular investor's contacts, I could be in for a big surprise if the quality of that work is not comparable. So that's another reason why a lot of realtors actually maybe don't like to give a value if they don't understand the quality that person's capable of doing. Well, I appreciate it, Chris. Glad to have you on here, and I'll see you next Wednesday. And uh, if you need anything at all, let me know. Otherwise, uh, keep doing what you do. That's awesome. Thank you, Keaton. And likewise, it's no doing all of these different investment strategies. Um, it's really nice to be able to say we can count on each other to just give people the information they need. The information is free, but what you do with it is is not. That's a gamble. 100%. <laughs> Lessons learned from watching other people make mistakes. That's one of the reasons why I love being a broker is I get to learn from people's successes and their failures. Um, yeah. You know, try to help everyone be as successful as possible, but the reality is mistakes are made and you get to learn from it. So, um, yeah. And I know you're in a similar boat. Of you get to uh, you get to learn through other people. So appreciate having you out. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. You too. Cheers.